Let's take a chilling journey into the past. The year is 1978, a time of innocence and change in the quaint town of Fairfax, Virginia. This seemingly peaceful community was rocked by a series of shocking events, from the conviction of James T. Clark Jr. for a cold-blooded murder for hire, to the tragic shooting of Curtis L. Funkhauser Jr. by his girlfriend, Laura V. Cloen. Amidst the closing of local schools and the shifting of county administrative headquarters, a sinister figure was born, a figure who would grow up to cast a long, dark shadow over Fairfax. Throughout history, there have been people who have committed some of the most heinous crimes fathomable. For those crimes, they have been convicted and sentenced to death. Welcome to Death Row Executions, where we take a look into the lives of society's worst offenders. And now, your host, Air. On April 13, 1978, Paul Warner Powell was born. There could be no way Paul's parents knew when they looked into their baby's eyes for the first time that sweet and pure innocence would one day grow up to be an evil, hateful, vengeful killer. There is little documentation of Paul's childhood, but what we do know is a little bit of background about the city Paul grew up in. Fairfax the city is the county seat of Fairfax County, Virginia, and it is an independent city in the Commonwealth of Virginia. That means, according to Virginia law, the city of Fairfax is not part of the county. Even though it is not part of the county, I would like to give some statistics about Fairfax County. Today, there are 52.3% white people and 9.5% black people in the county. In an article by Margaret Barthel, she claims the history of racial discrimination in Virginia has led to islands of disadvantage or areas within Virginia that are at a disadvantage and surrounding areas look down on the quote-unquote islands. We don't know specifics about Paul's childhood, but we do know that he grew up to be a white supremacist. He did not believe in race mixing, and he believed his race was the superior race. These deep-seated beliefs were running through his veins as a teenager. By the time Paul was 17, he met a 13-year-old girl by the name of Stacy Lynn Reed. Stacy had an 11-year-old sister by the name of Christy, and the two were very close. Christy knew of Paul as her older sister's friend, and despite the age difference, the two remained friends for almost three years. During their time knowing each other, Paul had a crush on Stacy, but he realized the age difference was a bit too much and he did not want to go to jail. He was able to refrain from doing anything inappropriate, but he was angered when Stacy started dating Sean Wilkerson. The reason for his anger was because Sean was black. Not only was Paul upset that he could not date Stacy, but he was upset that Stacy was race mixing. On his end, he developed a love-hate relationship with Stacy. Even when Paul had to move out of town, he remained in contact with Stacy and concerned himself with her business. While Paul was away, Stacy, who was now in high school, was doing good for herself. She had joined the Junior Reserve Officers Training Corps at her school and was planning on attending the military ball with her boyfriend, Sean. When Paul got wind of Stacy's plans, it upset him. He decided to pay Stacy a visit. On January 29, 1999, Stacy, now 16, made it home from school early that day, and as soon as she made it inside of her home, she was greeted by Paul. The two began to socialize for a bit, but Paul left about 45 minutes after Stacy's arrival, which was 12.45 p.m. His reason for leaving was because Stacy informed him that her mother Lorraine's fiancé, Robert Culver, was coming home for his lunch break. Paul wanted to be alone with Stacy because his true intentions were to confront her about her interracial relationship with Sean. When Paul came back for the second time, he had equipped himself with multiple weapons, including a box cutter and a pistol. Stacy was on the phone with Sean, and as soon as she ended the phone call, Paul questioned Stacy about why she was with Sean and requested that she break up with him for the sake of her white race. Stacy told Paul that she would not be breaking up with Sean, no matter what he said or did. Now this is according to Paul, but initially he said the two began to argue, and then it turned physical. Paul then said he took out a survival weapon from his belt, and Stacy quote-unquote got stuck. After getting attacked and wounded, Stacy fell to the floor. Even if the wound was accidental, Paul did nothing to make sure Stacy was okay and did not call for help. Instead, he casually walked around the house and had enough nerve to make himself a glass of iced tea. When he was done with his drink, he chose to open up a pack of cigarettes and smoke. After some time had passed, Stacy's sister Christy made it home from school, and by that time, it was a little after 3 p.m. When she opened the front door, she discovered Paul was in her house. 
Pole told Christy that Stacy was in her room. Thinking nothing of it, Christy walked into her bedroom, and that is when she noticed her sister's body lying on the floor. Terrified and shocked, Christy dropped all of her supplies she was carrying from school and began sobbing. Christy did not have her mother there to comfort her, and her sister was unable to help her either. Paul then demanded that Christy walk to the basement. Christy knew that Paul was someone who always walked around with weapons on him, so she followed all of his instructions because she did not want to die like her sister. While in the basement, Paul ordered Christy to remove her clothing and to get on the floor. Still scared and complying with every command, Paul got on top of Christy and began to sexually assault her. Christy pleaded for Paul not to kill her. During the assault, Christy's friend Mark Lewis knocked on the door and the knock startled Paul. Paul immediately wound Christy's hands behind her back with shoelaces he had cut off of the shoe she was wearing and he also tied her feet together. Paul then quickly got dressed and made his way upstairs to the front door to greet Mark, but he heard commotion in the basement. The shoelaces weren't enough to hold Christy because she managed to free her hands and maneuver herself across the basement floor to a hiding spot under the basement steps. Before answering the door, Paul went back downstairs to the basement. Fear gripped Christy's heart as she heard Paul's heavy footsteps approaching her hiding spot. Knowing she couldn't stay hidden any longer, she frantically scrambled back to where Paul had left her. Paul noticed that her hands were free, so Paul angrily grabbed a shoelace and used it to cut off Christy's air supply. As Christy fell into unconsciousness, Paul sadistically inflicted wounds upon her abdomen, wrists, and throat. When he was finished with his brutal assault, he went back upstairs to see if Mark was at the door, but to his surprise, Mark was no longer there. Confident that both Christy and Stacy were dead, Paul then decided to make yet another glass of iced tea before leaving the Reed family home. Believing himself to be in the clear, Paul fled to the District of Columbia with a friend and indulged in crack cocaine. Meanwhile, Robert Culver returned to the house around 4 o'clock in the afternoon after he got off of work. Upon hearing Christy's cries for help from the basement, he rushed down to find her battered and barely conscious. Calling 911 immediately, Robert did everything in his power to assist Christy in her grave condition. As he searched for Stacy, he discovered her lifeless body and realized with horror that she had been killed. Although in shock and pain, by the time paramedics arrived, Christy mustered up enough strength to tell them who her attacker was, Paul, her sister's supposed friend. The authorities wasted no time tracking down Paul and arresting him at his friend's girlfriend's house in the District of Columbia. Christy's condition was so bad that she had to be transported by helicopter to the Fairfax Hospital. Thankfully, despite being injured just one centimeter away from a major artery, Christy survived the attack. As for Stacy, an autopsy was conducted and they concluded that she died from the injury Paul had inflicted, the wound that punctured Stacy's heart. The wound also indicated that the weapon had been inserted, partially taken out, and inserted again, which went against Paul's jab statement. Also contrary to Paul's words, him and Stacy did not just have a small struggle. Most likely, Stacy was fighting for her life because she had wounds and bruises on her head, chest, abdomen, back, arms, legs, face, and forearms. There was also bleeding inside her scalp before she actually died from her heart wound. Detectives gathered Paul's survival kit and tested all of the weapons on it. DNA on some of the weapons matched Stacy's blood, and they also swapped Christie's vaginal cavity and determined that the sample collected matched Paul's DNA. With a positive identification, Paul was sent to prison on January 30, 1999 at the age of 20. While in prison, Paul wrote letters to many friends and associates letting them know that he indeed did everything they were claiming he did to Stacy, and he only did it because Stacy was in a relationship with a black man, and that was the lowest she could ever be. He believed that despite being a pedo and a crack addict, he was far better of a man than Sean. In some letters, he also claimed that he planned to actually kill Stacy's whole family and to steal their family car. The prison also intercepted another letter intended for a female friend, and in this letter, he was quoted writing, Get one of her guy friends to go to a payphone and call Christy and tell her that she better tell the cops she lied to them and tell her that she better not testify against me or she's gonna die. He confided in an inmate and told this inmate that he was angry with Stacy for not wanting to have intercourse with him after talking to her boyfriend on the phone. Paul also told the inmate that he attacked Stacy with a weapon and he wanted to use the same weapon on Christy's throat, but it was too dull, so he began stepping on her instead. 
Paul had no issues blabbing to friends and inmates because he also told another inmate that killing Stacy was a human sacrifice and he was satisfied with what he did to Christy and it was satisfying because she'd never had intercourse in her life and he was the first. By the time trial began, prosecutors now had a full story about the leading up to the horrible murder that took place on January 29, 1999. A day before Stacy was murdered, Paul showed up at her house. At that time, it was only Paul, Christy, and Stacy in the Reed family home. Stacy had to leave in the afternoon for work, and while she was out, Paul decided to stay behind. Now, it was only Paul and Christy in the home. Christy grew more and more uncomfortable because Paul kept walking back and forth down the hallway looking in all of the rooms, so she called her mother Lorraine and told her that Paul was refusing to leave the house. While still on the phone, Lorraine told Paul that he needed to leave. Paul left that day and things went back to normal. The next day, on January 29th, when Christy came home from school, she was shocked to see that Paul was back at her house. She asked Paul where Stacy was and Paul replied that she was in her room. Christy walked to Stacy's room and didn't see her, so then she turned to go to her room and that is when she saw Stacy's body lying on the floor. Paul was following Christy the whole time and when he saw that she discovered Stacy's body, that is when he instructed her to go downstairs to the basement. The court was also made aware that he told officers that he sexually assaulted Christy. A detective testified that Paul told him the only reason Christy had to die was because she was the only witness and he would have to go to jail if she decided to rat on him. There were many witnesses during Paul's trial, but the key witness was Christy Reed because she was Paul's surviving victim. She provided crucial testimony against Paul. Paul's trial began in 2000, and that same year, a jury came back with a guilty verdict. Paul was found guilty of all four charges that ranged from capital murder of Stacey Lynn Reed and attempted capital murder of Christy Aaron Reed. Judge German Wisenot Jr., who was presiding over the case, agreed with the jury and Paul was sentenced to death in September of 2000. After being sentenced to death, Paul was sent to death row at the Greensville Correctional Center in Virginia. While on death row, there was an automatic appeal and while reviewing this appeal, the courts decided to reverse the death sentence conviction and remanded the case to the circuit court for a new trial on a charge no greater than first-degree murder for the killing of Stacy Reed. With the Virginia Supreme Court overturning Paul's death sentence because they ruled that there was insufficient evidence to prove that Paul had attempted to sexually assault Stacy, there were now no aggravating factors to warrant a death sentence. Paul was not yet a free man, though. He was still serving life sentences for sexually assaulting Christy. Paul was still happy, though. He believed he had escaped death and decided to write a letter to the prosecutor in his trial, boasting about his crimes. He believed he would never be tried for the same charges and would be free from any death sentences. Paul wrote two letters to the Commonwealth's attorney of Prince William County, and that attorney's name was Paul Ebert. Mr. Ebert, since I have already been indicted on first-degree murder and the Virginia Supreme Court said that I can't be charged with capital murder again, I figured I would tell you the rest of what happened on January 29th 1999 to show you how stupid all of you mother are. Y'all should have known that there is more to the story than what I told by what I said. You had it in writing that I planned to kill the whole family. Since I planned to kill the whole family, why would I have fought with Stacy before killing her? She had no idea I was planning to kill everybody and talked and carried on like usual, so I could have stabbed her up at any time because she was unsuspecting. I had other plans for her before she died. You know, I came back to the house after Bobby's lunch break was over and he had went back to work. When I got back, she was on the phone, so I went inside and I laid down on the couch. When the cab came to bring me my pager, I ran out of the house and she jumped and got off the phone and came off the porch to see why I ran out of the house like I did. When the cab left, we went inside the house. I laid on the couch again and she went to her room and got her clothes and went downstairs to do her laundry. When she went downstairs, I got up and shut and locked the back door and went downstairs. We talked while she put her clothes in the wash. We continued talking when she had everything in the wash, and I reached over and touched her tit and asked if she wanted to fuck. She said no because she had a boyfriend. I started arguing with her because she had never turned anybody down because of having a boyfriend. We started walking upstairs, arguing the whole time. When we got upstairs, we went to her room, and she turned the radio off. After she turned the radio off, I pushed her onto the bed and grabbed her wrists and pinned her hands down by her head and sat on top of her. I told her that all I wanted to do was fuck her and then I would leave and that we could do it the easy way or the hard way. She said she would fuck me so I got up. 
After I got up, she got up and started fighting with me and clawed my face. We wrestled around a little, and then I slammed her to the floor. When she hit the floor, I sat on top of her and pinned her hands down again. She said she would fuck me, and I told her that if she tried fighting with me again, I would kill her. When I got up, she stood up and kept asking me why I was doing this, and all I kept saying is, take your clothes off. Finally, she undid her pants and pulled them down to her ankles. She was getting ready to take them the rest of the way off, and the phone rang. When she heard the phone, she pulled her pants back up and said she had to answer the phone. I pushed her back and said no. She said that she wouldn't say anything about me being there, and I told her no and to take her clothes off. She tried to get out of the room again, and I pushed her back and pulled out my knife. I guess she thought I was just trying to scare her and that I wouldn't really stab her because she tried to leave again. When she got to me and tried to squeeze between me and the door jam, I stabbed her. When I stabbed her, she fell back against the door jam and just looked at me with a shocked look on her face. When I pulled the knife out, she stumbled a couple of steps and fell into her sister's room. I walked over and looked at her. I saw that she was still breathing, so I stepped over her body and into the bedroom. Then I put my foot on her throat and stepped up so she couldn't breathe. Then I stepped down and started stumping on her throat. Then I stepped back onto her throat and moved up and down, putting more pressure to make it harder to breathe. When I didn't see her breathing anymore, I left the room and got some iced tea and sat on the couch and smoked a cigarette. You know the rest of what happened after that point. I would like to thank you for saving my life. I know you're probably wondering how you saved my life, so I'll tell you. You saved my life by picking up. There were two main pickups you made that saved me. The first was the way you worded my capital murder indictment. The second was the comment you made in your closing argument when you said we don't know because he won't tell us. One more time, thank you. Now y'all know everything that happened in that house at 8023 McLean Street on January 29th, 1999. I guess I forgot to mention these events when I was being questioned. Ha ha, psych. I knew what y'all would be able to prove in court, so I told you what you already knew. Stacy was dead and no one else was in the house, so I knew y'all would never know everything she went through unless she came back to life. Since the Supreme Court said I can't be charged with capital murder again, I can tell you what I told you because I no longer have to worry about the death penalty. And y'all are supposed to be so smart. I can't believe that y'all thought I'd told you everything. Well, it's too late now. Nothing you can do about it now. So fuck you, you fat, fuck sucking, dumb guzzling gutter shit. I guess I'll see your p on December 18th at trial because I'm not pleading to p Tell the family to be ready to testify and relive it all again because if I have to suffer for the next 50 to 60 years or however long then, then they can suffer the torment of reliving what happened for a couple of days. I'm gone you and anyone like you or that associates with people like you. I almost forgot. Fuck your God, too. Jesus knows how to suck a real good. Did you teach him? Well, die a slow, painful, miserable death. See ya, punk. Do you just hate yourself for being so stupid and for fucking up and saving me? Sincerely, Paul Powell. In the second letter to attorney Ebert, Paul wrote, Fat Ebert, what's up, you fathead f***er? I'm just writing to tell you since you want to kill me so bad for killing your loving whore, set up a court date closer than October 25th so I can go ahead and get this over with and plead guilty so you can kill me and get it over with. Unless you want to let me out so I can kill the rest of your lovers and all the Jews, Spicks, and everybody else in this up country that's not white. That includes you because you are your loving Jewish fucking it. I will see you in hell, bitch. Your buddy, Paul Powell. P.S. Watch your back. Paul also sent a letter to his victim's mother, Lorraine Reed. In the envelope, there was a photograph of a partially nude woman. The letter read, Lorraine, I was wondering if you might be able to help me think of something. I found this picture in a magazine, and it kind of looks like someone I know or used to know, but I can't think of the person's name. I think you know the person too, so I was wondering if you could tell me the name of the person this picture resembles so I can quit racking my brain trying to think of it. I would appreciate it. If you don't know the person I'm talking about, Ask Christy or Kelly Welsh because I know they know who I'm thinking of. If you talk to the person I'm talking about, please give her my address and tell her to write me. The partially nude woman shown in the photograph resembled Lorraine Reed's daughter, Stacy, and Paul knew it would get to her, but his disturbed brain did not care. In another letter to a friend, he wrote, About when you asked me why I wouldn't do to you what I did to Stacy, I couldn't ever hurt you because you mean too much to me. See, Stacy didn't mean anything to me. She was a 
Her lover and some of her wannabe skinhead friends were supposed to kill me. That's part of the reason why she died. Almost everything that happened in that house was planned. The only thing that wasn't planned was trying to fuck Christy. What was supposed to happen was, Stacy was supposed to die, and did. Christy was supposed to die, and then I was going to wait for their mom and stepdad to get home, and I was going to kill them, and then I was going to take their mom's truck, and then I was going to go to North Carolina and knock this dude off that stole all of my clothes and everything else I owned. I had been thinking about doing it for a long time, but I could never bring myself to do it. I don't know what happened to make me finally do it. I feel bad for doing it. Stacy was a good kid. What Paul didn't know was that in terms of the principle of double jeopardy, which is the legal concept that prohibits an individual from being tried twice for the same crime, it did not apply to him in his case. That is because his capital murder verdict had been vacated, but he had not been acquitted of the criminal charge and was still eligible to be retried for first-degree murder. Also, with double jeopardy, it does not protect an individual from subsequent prosecution if the case was dismissed on the grounds that were not related to the defendant's factual guilt or innocence. Also, cases that are appealed and result in subsequent convictions are considered a continuation of the original trial and thus are not considered double jeopardy. I'm pretty sure Attorney Ebert did not think anything less of himself by being called stupid so many times by Paul. In the end, Paul was the ignorant one. Now the prosecutor had all the evidence that he needed. Paul was charged with attempted sexual assault and murder of Stacy Reed for his retrial. All of the letters he wrote were read in court. Jurors were also made aware of new evidence. The jury was able to view writings and drawings from Paul's jail cell that showcased his hatred of people who were not white. They heard testimony from officers that heard Paul saying things like, everybody that ain't white should die, and that he wanted to kill a lot of somebodies just for something to do. Lastly, the jury was made aware of Paul's previous criminal record that happened before the murder of Stacy. He had three prior convictions for contributing to the delinquency of a minor and two larceny convictions. His three felony convictions for crimes against Christie were also mentioned. In 2003, at the conclusion of this retrial, Robert was once again sentenced to death. Paul had the option to choose the method in which he wanted to die, the electric chair or lethal injection, and he chose the electric chair. His scheduled execution was set for March 18, 2010. Over the years, he did appeal his case for reasons like having an ineffective counsel, but all of his appeals were denied. A day before he was set to die, Lorraine Reed accepted a prison call from Paul. In the phone call, he acknowledged everything he did to her daughters, and he was quoted saying that it was a senseless and pointless thing. He ended things by saying he was sorry. Despite all of the horrible things he said and did over the years to torment her, and what he did to her daughters, Lorraine said that she turned to prayer for consolation and decided to forgive Paul. She said that she felt a serene peace that came over her body after making the decision to forgive him. Lorraine and Christy were present for Paul's execution, and she said it was something her daughter Christy needed in order to find closure. Paul spent his final hours sitting in a holding cell, while prison officials tested the electric chair in preparation for his execution. To prepare Paul for his electric chair execution, they shaved his head and his right leg. On the evening of March 18, 2010, Paul was taken from his holding cell into the execution room wearing a light blue prison uniform and shackles. His right pant leg was cut off above the knee. At 8.58 p.m., Paul was read his death warrant, and a guard approached him and turned on a microphone. He then asked Paul, Do you have any last words? Paul remained silent. He looked up at the ceiling and then straight towards the witness gallery where Christy Reed and Lorraine Reed were. Since he had nothing to say, a mask was put over his face covering his eyes, mouth, and nose. At exactly 9 o'clock p.m., an executioner in the control room pressed a small red button marked on. His execution began, and 19 minutes later, Paul was pronounced dead. Thank you all for watching another episode of Death Row Executions. Let me know what you guys think of this story in the comments below.